My name is Tom Sanderson, a freelance documentary filmmaker passionate about travel. Over the past 12 years I've visited many weird and wonderful places, however there has always been one country that stood out from the rest, a country known as North Korea. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK for short, is often featured in Western media, regularly reporting on their strong political presence, testing of missiles and general scaremongering. Stories like this only give a one-sided view of a situation and I wanted to get a clearer picture of what life is really like for the people of North Korea and if they really do pose a threat to the West. It didn't take much research to realise there are numerous companies offering tours to the DPRK. Along with the return of the mass games following a five year break I could think of no better time to visit. Plus the country would celebrate their independence day with a military parade on the 9th of September 2018 marking 70 years of independence. So it's about one week till I set off. Uh, just got the passport back, so that's good. Chinese visa in there. And so today I also need to get my money changed because uh, foreign tourists can't use North Korean currency. So I need to go and pick up some, uh, some of that currency today as well as euros. Then all that's left to do is just to pack I'm almost packed, got everything laid out and um, had a little look at the weather. It's actually really warm there. It's going to be uh, shorts and t-shirt weather, but I've took a couple of scarves and jumpers and things just in case. So the trip's booked, I booked through uh, an online company. Uh, it was relatively easy actually because they sort all your visa and everything for you, so didn't have to do any of that. It was actually more of an issue getting the Chinese visa because I need a double entry one. I fly into Beijing and then we go up to Dangdong in China, which is a full day train ride. And then from there, Dangdong across to uh, Pyongyang in North Korea. Uh, I'll be in North Korea for five days in total. Um, we'll be arriving by train. So it'd be nice to see the transition from going from China across the Friendship Bridge uh, into North Korea. Whilst you're there, obviously there's a few uh, highlights that you can go and see. The DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone um, on the border of South Korea is one of them. Um, and the area mass games as well is another big um, a big highlight for me um, but yeah I'm really looking forward to it now very excited and uh, also slightly nervous as to uh, as to what to expect but I really just want to want to get going now So we've arrived in Beijing, we've got uh, two days here to have a look around before tomorrow we meet the uh, group at uh, Beijing Railway Station um, where we're going to get the sleeper train up to Dongdang before getting the other train from Dongdang into North Korea. So it's time to have a little look around Beijing. The next day it was time to meet up with the group at the Beijing Railway Station. Nice to meet you. Hi, Yaniv. Yaniv, nice to meet you mate. Sure. Once we had navigated through the busy station, we boarded our 10 hour overnight train to Dongdang. Having a few hours on the train was a great way to have some beers and get to know the group I'd be spending the next few days with. The 
following morning in Dangdong, we met our tour group leader and we were issued our North Korean visas. Next, we had a long wait to get through Chinese immigration. It was a weird feeling knowing that once we were on the next train and across the Friendship Bridge, we would be officially inside North Korea. So this is us leaving China and now we're going to head to the border, is that right? Or head to immigration? I guess, there's no one's checked the visas yet. Yeah, no. The train crosses the Friendship Bridge over the Yalu River on the North Korea and China border. Notice how built up the Chinese side of the river is and how the Korean side is just farmland. We were now officially inside North Korea. On first impressions, the fields and countrysides were much greener than I had imagined. There seemed to be plenty of crops growing, however, could that all just be there for the tourists' benefit? Either way, there was plenty of time to soak up the scenery as it would take another 6 to 8 hours on this train before we reached Pyongyang. As we approached Pyongyang, Toy Town pastel buildings came into view. Each one looked a little too perfect, like their purpose was to show how the average Koreans lived. On the platform we were greeted with TV cameras. All of a sudden I was very aware of just how many tourists had come here and the Korean people were just as interested in us as we were them. Our guides met us in traditional dress before being hurried out of the station and into the waiting coaches outside, ensuring there was no time to speak or mingle with any locals. As the bus travelled through Pyongyang, we were given a speech about the glorious fatherland and what to expect on the trip. Our, country, our fatherland was founded in 1948, uh, September the 9th, 1948. So this year is the 17th birthday of our country. Yeah, so, so I think on the September the 9th, we can see what in Pyongyang several functions will be taking place. I instead took the time to look out of the window at the local Koreans and let the past 24 hours sink in. It really felt like travelling back in time. The people were in modest dress, nobody had a smartphone, plus no locals have cars so everyone uses the trolley buses or trams. I was surprised by how clean the place was, there wasn't a piece of litter anywhere. Maybe the people of Pyongyang were very proud and respectful of their city, or Perhaps no one dare drop litter. The rest of the evening consisted of a meal at a Korean restaurant serving kimchi, rice, meat and seafood before being serenaded with a song on the coach back to the hotel. So uh, this is the view from the hotel window in Pyongyang. And as you can see, the uh, Pyongyang rush hour is well underway. There's absolutely no cars. It's like a ghost town. Nice view though. Nice sunrise. Our first full day in North Korea. We were on a bus heading north from Pyongyang towards Mount Myohang. The scenery was beautiful and unspoiled from traffic jams or industry. The journey took around three hours and we passed hardly any other vehicles on the route.
So behind me is uh, Mount Meihong. This is the uh, first stop on our trip in North Korea. It's, uh, Meihong means nice smell, uh, or roughly translated means beautiful, gorgeous smell, uh, because of the pine trees that are in this area, and it does smell nice. At the foot of the mountain is the International Friendship Exhibition Hall, a museum housing over 100,000 gifts given to the dear leader by other nations around the world. Some of the gifts included train carriages, bulletproof limousines and even a plane, but we weren't allowed to film anything inside. I was surprised to see just how many friends the dear leader claimed to have. No gifts from the UK government though. Uh, one of the temples that we're visiting, but keeps feeling like we're being watched. I don't know if you can see that that guy there behind me. He's uh, he's our guide, and he's keeping an eye on us, seeing what we're up to. So this is the Gangsan Hotel, where it's apparently the best hotel in uh, in Korea. Uh, we've stopped here for lunch. Um, it is more modern than the one we're staying in, but it's like um, still got that 70s vibe to it, as you can see. And a glass elevator as well. That afternoon, we headed back to Pyongyang to the military museum. Along the way, the bus pulled over and our guide, Mr. Kim, came to the back to tell me off for filming out of the window. Apparently, we had passed a military post which I wasn't allowed to film. When we arrived at the military museum, I decided to ask our guides about the incident. What was, uh, what was the problem on the bus? Did, was it, did we go past a military place or something? When we you were, should uh, do check up. Yeah. You should do check up. Was it okay. Yeah, no, but in the, on the bus. On the put you, your. You said not put to. Put your luggages. No earlier, when we were driving. You know when you come up to me. To the back of the bus. Oh, when you pass the uh, check up post. Oh, I, post? yeah, I didn't yeah. see. <laughs> this is where things went weird. As soon as she realised I was asking about restrictions on filming, she said something about military check post and then quickly walked away. Perhaps she didn't like being confronted on this issue. The Military Museum was a showcase of North Korea's apparent victory over the US, in particular a warship named the USS Pueblo. Pueblo was captured in 1968 by the Koreans during the Cold War, and now resides in the centre of Pyongyang for visitors to see, and be told of how the imperialist spy ship was commandeered. Inside the vessel was peppered with bullet holes and shrapnel marks, along with photographs of the crew being taken prisoner. I was looking forward to the last stop of the day, a local school. I was hoping to meet some of the pupils, give them gifts and learn about their daily life. What we really got was something quite different.
I left with mixed feelings about the school visit. I enjoyed the performance but couldn't help wondering if the children were made to learn the songs and instruments, or if they had chosen to do it themselves. We were even told to leave the gifts we'd bought at the side of the stage whilst the children just stood and clapped. As with most things in North Korea, it felt hurried and distant from local interaction. Day 2. Today was the big one. September the 9th, 2018, an Independence Day in North Korea. Today marked 70 years of independence, and to celebrate would welcome the return of the Mass Games last performed back in 2013. There were even reports that the dear leader may attend the opening ceremony. But before the evening's events, we were taken on a hike a short distance outside the city. So it's uh, September the 9th, today is the Independence Day, um, so all the streets in Pyongyang are closed, uh, so we've come out to the countryside to do some hiking. Um, this, this mountain's called uh, Ryong Ak, it means Dragon Rock, and I think it's quite a popular spot for uh, local Koreans to come when they get a chance. It's beautiful though around here, lots of, uh, lots of bugs and stuff though, but yeah it's beautiful. So we've reached this temple at the top of the mountain. We're about 300 meters up, so it's not the highest mountain in North Korea, but it does give you a really good view of Pyongyang over here. You can see it's quite smoggy. It's amazing. And this is the first time we've actually managed to uh, break away from our guides. <laughs> so it's a uh, chance for a bit of freedom here. I thought it was Ryong Ak. No, Ryong Dai. In Korean. And uh, the guides were hiking with us, but we went so fast that they, um, they, they, we've now lost them, so we're currently walking around. We keep thinking these people are looking for us as well on the motorbikes, <laughs> but they're, um, no one's stopping, so I don't think we're in any real trouble yet. yet. <laughs> Are we are we in trouble or is it okay? Good. <laughs> Thank you for what else? Yeah. What else Thank did you. we have? So we've we found the group again. We've made it back here, um, and we're, we're we're not the last ones back. There's still two people missing, um, but luckily our our guides aren't too uh, annoyed with us. She said it was she was more concerned than annoyed. Once the group was back together, everyone was eager to get back to the hotel in preparation for the mass games that evening. the day after the uh, Independence Day in North Korea and last night was the uh, mass games that we went to see. Now probably wondering why there's no filming done of that. Well we were told about uh, 10 minutes before we got on the bus that absolutely no cameras, no phones, no anything apart from uh, money was allowed to be taken into the, um, into the arena. And the reason for this was because the, uh, the president, Kim Jong-un, was there. Um, so he had special seating on the balcony um, because it was the first or the opening ceremony of the, the mass games um, in so long. I think it was five years ago, the last one, 2013. Um, they did, however, let us have uh, like a memory card with some of the images on that, that, that they take. Um, I guess it's because they don't want us to film anything of the... Uh, of their leader and portray him in any sort of different way than, than how they want to do it. So 
yeah, it was a bit of a shame, a bit of a disappointment not being able to film it, but the show itself was absolutely incredible. Really, really good. We enjoyed it. So many performers and they're all, um, you know, work together brilliantly and uh, it was a really, really brilliant show. Luckily, I did manage to get some footage from one of the other tour guides who visited the Mass Games on a different night. So here it is, the glorious fatherland Mass Games. The following morning there were high spirits in the group as everyone really enjoyed the mass games. Today we made our way south towards Kaesong, a town bordering South Korea, otherwise known as the DMZ, or Demilitarized Zone. Once described as the scariest place on earth by Bill Clinton, I was eager to see what the hype was about and whether tensions between North and South were still high at the border. So we're about halfway to the uh, DMZ now. We've just uh, stopped for a toilet break and a coffee. And um, we're gonna go through a few checkpoints soon, but the conversation on the bus has turned a little bit this morning. People wanna talk about the unification of both um, the North and South Korea. And it's quite interesting getting the perspective of how our guides feel about the unification. We seem to think, to unite Korea, it would be an easy thing to do, and that it would it would all be fine. And they seem to think that the uh, it would help their economy as well. It's quite interesting talking to them and getting their perspective. You know about how uh, it's probably the most propaganda we've had on this trip so far to told to us. As you may imagine, there were a number of checkpoints to get anywhere near South Korea, to the point where the last few metres had to be made on foot. Military personnel then herded us into a room to be told the do's and don'ts at the border. Luckily this time pictures were allowed. I was surprised however to see a gift shop at the DMZ, filled with a number of people scrambling to get their hands on painted propaganda artwork. What shocked me the most was this is the first time I had felt like a tourist in North Korea and the sheer number of people that had chosen to visit this part of the world. Yeah, 
So uh, right behind me there is the border with um, the DMZ, and that's uh, South Korea. And the blue buildings are the ones that are controlled by Korea, just these ones here. And then beyond that line is South Korea. Okay, let's go. And we're getting moved on now. The guards seemed edgy whilst everyone was taking pictures and took us back inside. However, up on the balcony things changed. The military were happy to have pictures taken and our guides were happy to be in the pictures too. For a moment it began to feel like everyone relaxed and wanted to have a bit of fun. It felt strange to stand in such a politically divided area to take selfies and pictures of each other. My feelings were that the opportunity to sell tourism had outweighed the unrest seen in previous years. The morning of our last day in North Korea had arrived. I felt quite sad to be leaving, not only because we had formed friendships within the group and with our guides, but because I felt there was so much more to this country we haven't seen. As a special treat, our guides agreed to take us on a tour of Pyongyang. First stop, the Pyongyang Metro. Supposedly the deepest metro in the world, rumours suggest that its depth provides protection as a bomb shelter. The metro was ornately decorated with propaganda and reminded me of the subway system in Moscow. Newspapers are framed on the platform and updated daily, mainly with stories about the recent mass games and of course the dear leader. We were allowed to ride the metro one way and then back again to where we had started. I wondered how all the other stations looked in comparison to this one as there are only two lines on the whole metro system. Inside the carriage was quiet and dimly lit and no one made eye contact with us or spoke to each other. Back above ground and the next visit was to some of the city's famous locations. First, the Workers' Party Monument to the people. A 50 metre high structure symbolising the workers, farmers and intellects of North Korea. The Juchi Idea Monument and Kim Il-sung Square. This is where the military parade is held and can hold over 100,000 people. During a normal day, however, it wasn't very busy. Not how you would expect the main square of a capital city. Then we saw North Korea's take on the Arc de Triomphe. And finally, as you exit the city, the Arch of Reunification, showing the North and South as one united Korea. I have to say, just taking the time to see the city was one of my highlights of the whole trip. Whenever I travel somewhere new, I love to wander around the streets and take in the atmosphere of the place, and it felt like we hadn't had a chance to do this yet in North Korea. By mid-afternoon, it was time to catch our train back to Sinuju, the North Korean border town with China. So it's the end of our trip, we're here at the railway station in Pyongyang, ready to take uh, this train home. This trip's been a real eye-opener, it's um, some things about North Korea were exactly how I thought they would be, and other things are completely not what I thought. It's, um, it's been a real changing, you know, life-changing experience coming here, 
and a very crazy one as well in some respects and it's definitely one that I'll, I'll never forget. After being here for uh, a few days it's left me feeling like I want to come back and see more um, and understand a little bit more about the people. Obviously it's been very busy this time of year with it being the uh, tourist season and the mass games. Um, I'm thinking now I might be come back in the winter and see when the, it's snowy and cold here and when there's less tourists because the way it's been I think you'll be allowed more freedom and that maybe the guards will be less strict about what you can and can't do. So who knows, maybe we'll come back. Back in China, and it hit me, the first thing I noticed is how everyone is on a phone. People are relaxed and laid back. There is advertising, signs, lights and notice boards, shops and fast food restaurants. There is litter on the ground, and things have returned to normal. My phone has a signal and is hit with a flurry of updates, messages and notifications. As I made my way back to the UK, I thought a lot about the people of North Korea. Would they be able to adapt to a more Western way of life? I thought about how much opportunity there would be to North Koreans if they opened up more. New businesses would thrive, boosting their economy, industry would grow and tourists would flock to experience their amazing performances, clean cities and acres of untouched forest. It seems like North Korea is that kid in the school playground that nobody talks to. Therefore, they strike back with threats of retaliation, further alienating themselves. Perhaps, if a peace agreement was made between the DPRK and the USA, and there was an end to the threats, I believe we would start to see a brighter future for the people of North Korea.